In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the faith of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant that in that same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. I'm titling the talk today, Particle Theology. And it's actually particle theology in inverted commas because those who mock this particular um, teaching, who abound today, mock it by calling it particle theology. So if that's what they want to call it, let's call it that. And I will explain what particle theology is. Particle theology. is our belief in the real presence. Our Lord is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And how is our Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament? There are several schools of thought as to how our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament. So as you know, as every Catholic believes, or should believe, or does believe, or you're a heretic, after the consecration, the bread and the wine are no longer there. They look like bread, they look like wine, but they are not bread and wine. After the consecration, what looks like bread is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. And what looks like wine is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. How do you explain that? There's a few schools of thought, a few people that have tried to explain what it is. We have, first of all, the Protestants who say it is a memorialism. What they mean by memorialism is that when our Lord at the Last Supper said, do this in memory of me, he meant to say, do this as a symbol of me. And so it's a pretend that our Lord, that the bread does not change from being bread and the wine does not change from being wine, but we pretend it's our Lord. That's what memorialism is. Another theory is impanation. Kind of like those empanadas. <laughs> Just the same way as our Lord became flesh, the Word became flesh, these people believe that Christ becomes bread. So, I guess that's the best way I can explain it. So just the same way as the Word became flesh, Christ became man, in the Eucharist, Christ becomes bread. Uh, that's false, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, that's impanation. Then there is consubstantiation. Consubstantiation means that the bread and the wine stay bread and wine, but our Lord kind of comes into the bread and kind of comes into the wine as well. So he's kind of, to put it in a horrible way, he's kind of possessing the bread and he's kind of <laughs> possessing the wine. That would be the consubstantiation. <clears throat> then we have the latest, I've skipped one, obviously, but I'm just going through the ones that are not it first. Then we have the latest theory, which would be Transsignification. This was uh, invented by Schillebex. Schillebex does not believe in substance. He believes substance is a Thomistic term that doesn't exist. And so, based on that, how do you explain the Blessed Sacrament without substance? He says that it's kind of a sacramental presence of Christ. So, Remember that sacrament is an exterior sign of an interior grace. He talks about, so exterior sign of an interior grace, it symbolizes something like the stop sign tells us to stop, but there's nothing in a stop sign that makes us stop unless you run into it. Um, so it's, it's a symbol. So, so our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament, not physically, but personally. What does that mean? Well, suppose we're physically present here. But suppose you're sitting here 
daydreaming about uh, kangaroos jumping in the outback of Australia. You are personally in the outback of Australia picturing the kangaroos jumping around even though you are physically present here. So along those lines, our Lord is not physically in the Blessed Sacrament, but He is projecting Himself there as if it were Him thinking about being in there. So He's there kind of personally sort of thing. Anyway, that was condemned by Pope Paul VI. So what is it? How, how do we explain? How does the Catholic Church explain the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament? I'll read from you from the Council of Trent. Because Christ our Redeemer declared that what he offered under the species of bread was truly his body, it has always been the faith of the Church of God, and this Holy Synod now again states it, that by the consecration of the bread and wine, a change takes place in which the entire substance of the bread is changed into the substance of the body of Christ, our Lord, and the entire substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church fittingly and properly entitles transubstantiation. If anyone says that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist together with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and denies the wonderful and unique change of the entire substance of the bread into Christ's body and the entire substance of the wine into his blood, only the appearances of bread and wine remaining, a change which the Catholic Church most appropriately calls transubstantiation, let him be anathema. So what do we got here? We've got a substantial change. Transubstantiation. What does that mean? Well, let's back up a bit and let's talk about substance and accidents. <clears throat> substance is what makes a thing what it is. It's the unchanging part of the thing that gives it what it is. So for example, of a dog. A dog might have hair or might have no hair. Might be fat or skinny or tall or short. But a dog is a dog. So it's dogness is what makes it a dog. So if the dog runs through a car wash and gets all soapied up in this big soapy bowl of fluffy <laughs> stuff, it doesn't stop being a dog. Even though it might not look like a dog at that moment, but it's still a dog. So its dogness would be its substance. A table, its tableness is its substance. It's what makes it a table. So you've got a table and you break a leg off the table. It's still a table, it's a broken table, but it's still a table. It's still got the substance of a table. Um, and you can go through everything. The trash can, it's trash can-ness is its substance. A person, a man, being a man is, is substance. Substance would be the thing that could exist of itself if we think of it of, it, of itself. Whereas the accidents cannot exist by themselves. So you can't picture red. You can see red because all the tables are red. But you can't picture a red walking around. Or you can't picture tall. You can picture something tall. But you can't picture tall walking around. Whereas you can picture dog, you can picture car, you can picture tree, you can picture these things. These things are substances. 
whereas the accidents depend on a substance to exist. And the accidents kind of make up the substance into something we can see and touch and distinguish from something else, kind of give it all its embodiment, but the accidents are the accidents. The accidents cannot exist without the substance. Is this all making sense? Kind of. So there's substance and then there's nine accidents according to St. Thomas. One of them would be place, one of them would be quality, so color, shape, all that fit under the, the accident of quality. There's place where the thing is, this particular geographic location. There's also the, the, um, the where as like the surroundings, what's around it. So who's sitting next to so-and-so. Then there's also habit, the clothing, like what clothing is this person wearing? That would be accidental as well. So all these different kinds of accidents. Now, substance is made up of matter and form. If you change the matter and the form, the substance changes into something else. However, usually, when the substance changes into something else, the accidents change as well. So, you take a lovely piece of bread and you put it in the toaster and you leave the toaster on for an hour. <laughs> it's not going to be bread anymore when you pull it out. It's going to be charcoal. So it has changed its substance. It used to be bread. Now it is charcoal. And the accidents have also changed. So it's going to be crunchy. It's going to be black. You're going to be able to write with it. <laughs> its accidents have changed. Every change of substance, and there's a lot of changes of substance. For example, um, water. You freeze water, it turns into ice. You have a substantial change. It used to be water, now it's ice. Um, uh, a tree is a tree. You cut it down, you chop it up, it turns into wood. You use it to build things, it can turn into a table. You uh, break it apart, it turns into lumber. You burn it, it catches on fire, it's now a fire. So you've got all these changes of substance. However, whenever there is a change of substance, usually the accidents reflect that. Probably the closest thing uh, that wouldn't reflect that would be when somebody just dies. So before they were a person, now they are a cadaver. Uh, their substance has changed, but their body quickly uh, rots, it could quickly decomposes. <coughs> The Blessed Sacrament is special in that, by a miracle of God, the substance changes, but the accidents remain the same. It's not changed by annihilation, it's not changed by creation, so the, the substance existed before, there was a substance there and it was changed. It is changed by mutation. So uh, the substance of the bread is not annihilated, taken away and then replaced with the substance of Christ. It's not changed where there was no substance of bread before. The substance of Christ was just placed there. It is changed by mutation. So the substance of the bread is changed into the substance of Christ. And the substance of the wine is changed into um, the substance of our Lord's precious blood. All good so far? Making sense? Okay, let's move on. How is Christ present in the Blessed Sacrament? Okay, Council of Trent tells us how our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament. First of all, by the words of consecration, by the power of the words of consecration, our Lord's body is present in the host. 
and our Lord's blood is present in the wine. Oh, you know what I mean. Our Lord's body is present in the accidents of the host, and our Lord's blood is present in the accidents of the wine. That is according to the words of consecration. So the priest says, in persona Christi says, this is my body. So by saying the word, this is my body, the host becomes our Lord's body. And by saying, this is my blood, the wine becomes our Lord's blood. That is by the power of the words. However, there is this magic word. Concomitance pops up every once in a while. So, where one person of the Blessed Trinity is, the other two persons of the Blessed Trinity are there by concomitance. So, your, your soul is a temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is present in your soul. But by concomitance, the Father and the Son are also present in your soul. In the Blessed Sacrament, our Lord is present, but by concomitance, the Father and the Holy Ghost are also present there. So this word concomitance, where our Lord's blood is, by concomitance, his body is also there. And where our Lord's body is, by concomitance, his blood is also there, because our Lord is alive. And you cannot separate body from blood in someone who is alive. So by concomitance. So therefore, by concomitance, in the chalice is our Lord's body. And in the host is our Lord's blood. By words of consecration, body is in the host, blood is in the chalice. By concomitance, body is in the chalice, what, uh, blood is in the host. So where you've got our Lord's body and blood, you also have his soul. So his soul is present in the chalice, and his soul is present in the host. And then by the hypostatic union, hypostatic union of our Lord with his humanity and divinity. By his hypostatic union, you also have his divinity where his body and soul are. So, that was a long explanation to tell you what sister told you when you are in school and made you rattle off by memory and you didn't give a second thought about it. But, in both the in both the host and the chalice, our Lord is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That easy. That is how our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, we're all good so far? Let's move on. of substance. So our Lord is not present in the Blessed Sacrament in a quantitative manner. Our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament according to the manner of substance. What does that mean? Well, that means if our Lord was present in a quantitative manner, he would be present in each individual host as another Christ. So, by being present in a manner of substance, it's going to be easier for me to explain it in this way. By being present in a manner of substance, the whole substance of our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament 
as substance of the Blessed Sacrament. What does that mean? That means, okay, you're here at St. Victor's, you get in your car, you start driving, you pass Blessed Sacrament, you pass St. Brendan's, you come back, you pass uh, Good Shepherd. You didn't just pass four Jesuses. That was the same Christ here, same our Lord at Blessed Sacrament, same our Lord at St. Brendan's, and so on. So our Lord is present once in all the tabernacles of the world. Okay, let's break it down a bit. You have the, the, the tabernacle, and you open up the tabernacle, and there are two ciboriums, and then you've got the luna for, the blessed, for benediction. That doesn't mean that there's one, two, three Jesuses there. And then you open up the ciborium and there's a hundred hosts. <laughs> that doesn't mean that he's there a hundred times. No, he's only there once. So he's once in all the churches of the world. He's once in the church. He's once in the tabernacle. You don't have to repeat your prayer 25 times to tell each host. And then, but it gets smaller than that. So if you break the host in half, it doesn't mean that you just broke our Lord in half. And you only have one leg here and <laughs> one leg there. No, it's our Lord in his entirety. So it's our Lord under the manner of substance. This comes good to know. Sometimes when you're in the most extreme situations, you get the smallest size host. So if there were 500 people present at Mass, and I forgot to consecrate a ciborium, and there were 10 hosts in the tabernacle, I'd probably be breaking up the host into very tiny little pieces, and I'd give you each a little tiny piece. It doesn't mean that you got any less of our Lord by receiving that little tiny piece. Or if you're in the hospital and you can't take anything solid, so the priest gives you a really little tiny piece of host, it doesn't mean that you only got a little tiny piece of our Lord. It means that you received our Lord in his entirety. This is where the particle theology comes in. Because if our Lord is there under the manner of substance, as long as you have something that fits the accidents of the bread, you have our Lord there in his entirety. So, okay, you got a crumb. A crumb looks like a crumb of bread. And it falls on the floor. That's our Lord sitting on the floor. And suppose it gets picked up by the vacuum and gets thrown in the dumpster. That's our Lord sitting in the dumpster. And then it'll probably go to a landfill. And then eventually in the landfill, it will corrupt by being in the dirt and so on and then cease to be with the accidents of the crumb anymore. And when the accidents of the crumb are no longer there, then our Lord is not there anymore. So his substance is gone. This is very real. This is not being made up and it's actually not an exaggeration. This is why people, people like to joke about it thinking it's an exaggeration. But really how can it be an exaggeration? If our Lord is there according to the manner of substance, when do we say that he is no longer there? Or can we say that he is no longer there? You know, it's possible for the priest to change the body, uh, to change the bread into the body and blood of our Lord. 
it's not possible for the priest to change it back. When you buy a blessed object, that blessed object loses its blessing because of the sin of simony. That doesn't happen with the Blessed Sacrament because it's a substantial change and the substance doesn't change back. So when you buy a host, it doesn't lose its blessing because it wasn't blessed. It's change of substance. So that host remains a host. There's nothing that can be done to change back the substance of the host back to bread. So it doesn't mean that, okay, so the host is getting smaller, 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 smaller. At what point does the substance change? Well, it, it doesn't. As long as the substance is there. Now, if it's dissolved in water and ceases to be bread, okay, there's a substance change. Uh, not a substance change. There's a change of accidents, and so our Lord ceases to be there in the substance. But a crumb is a crumb. A crumb is a, a crumb is of the accidents of bread. It's always going to be a Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. Now this is where it gets beautiful, because the rubrics of the extraordinary form of the Mass are designed to protect every single particle. This is where it's really cool. By the rules themselves of the Mass every single particle is accounted for. And particles are more important than you think. They, they're, they're there. By they're there, I mean that after I've held the host for the elevation, and I bring my hands down, my fingers are like this, I feel the particles. I've got a particle or two on my fingers. People have done studies of this, and just by contact with the host on your hand, the average is 2.5 crumbs are left on your hand by receiving communion on the hand. Um, when you put the host on the corporal, there are always crumbs underneath it on the corporal. When you empty out the ciborium, there are always crumbs in the bottom of the ciborium. The crumbs are always there. But the rubrics of the Extraordinary Form of the Mass do a fantastic job of capturing every crumb. This is where it's beautiful. So, for a start, after the consecration, after the priest says the words of consecration of the host, you'll notice that he holds his hands like this. And his fingers, his thumb and his forefinger are joined. And they only separate to touch the host, and otherwise they're always closed. And this becomes second nature for the priest. First of all, it's easy for him to do the key in the tabernacle. It's kind of challenging when you when you go home from work to, uh, when you go home tonight. Why don't you pull out your keys out of your pocket and try to open your door without using these two fingers? Along those same lines, according to the extraordinary form, if the priest did not have these fingers, he couldn't say mass. There was one exception. Um, St. Isaac jokes. He got his fingers chewed off by the Indians. And the Pope said, okay, well, it's kind of not right if a martyr for Christ cannot offer the mass for Christ. And so you get the exception. However, there had been requests to the Vatican of a priest who lost his finger and asked the Pope, if I get a finger made in solid gold, can I use that to say Mass? And the Pope said no. So without these two fingers, the priest can't say Mass. That's incidentally why they bit his fingers off, because they knew that if they bit his fingers off, he wouldn't be able to say Mass. Um, <clears throat> It really does become second nature. I remember once it was a solemn high mass and I was the deacon. And at a solemn high mass, it looks very beautiful and the choir sounds very nice. But if you're serving on the altar, there is a lot of tension 
trying to remember what do I do next. <laughs> and you people in the pew don't see this, and the priests and the deacons and all those guys are all very devout about it, but it's true, and it's there. And so I'm there at Mass, and I'm worrying about what do I do next, and I'm noticing that I've got my hands like this. I look down, I'm like, why is my finger like this? <laughs> and I had to think about it for a minute, and then I realized, oh yes, I gave communion, and I didn't purify my finger. So, as a deacon of the Mass, I had helped out with communion, and I guess wherever that church was that particular day, didn't have the lavabo dish next to the tabernacle, so I didn't purify my finger. So I'm like, okay, well, I gotta take care of this. So. So I left the sanctuary and purified my fingers. But it, it becomes second nature. And I never really had the situation where my fingers being joined when I haven't touched the Blessed Sacrament, curiously enough. But when I have, it's there, it's closed. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so the different gestures of the Mass. Whenever the priest uncovers the chalice or actually I say it when he goes to cover the chalice back up again before he covers the chalice back up again no matter what it was he always does this over the chalice and that is just to get off any excess particles that might have been on his fingers before he covers the chalice the corporal is nice some of you might see. I don't know how to do this. I'll do it here. Just look. By the way, this corporal is not. It's fine. It's fine. By the way, this corporal is clean. It's never been used for mass, so there's no particles on this corporal. The corporal is placed into the verse in a particular way, a specific way to put it in the verse. So that when the priest gets to the altar, he pulls it out and puts it down. Flat on the table, uh, flat on the altar, like that. He doesn't have to fiddle around, turn it around, okay, where's the top, where's the bottom? No, he pulls it directly out of the burst, straight onto the altar. And then there is a specific way to open it left, right, back, forward. You leave the corporal away from the edge of the altar because if it's hanging over the altar a bit and you hit it with your fingers, there's always that danger the hose that is on the corporal might pop up. So you always have it away from the edge of the altar so there's not that danger of popping off the host. Now, this is kind of looking at it from straight down on the altar. Let me flip around. The host is going to be placed right here. When you fold up the corporal again, that crease is going to be closest to the center of the corporal. So you fold it up right where that host was. Now that crease is at the bottom. And then you fold up the top, center, center. And then at the very center of the corporal, now, are all the particles from that host. They're not getting out, no matter how you shake it. They're in there. They're in there kind of like in a plastic bag almost. And then it goes back into the verse, and now the altar service is not allowed to touch this. <laughs> because it has particles in it. So, even the manner of folding the corporal is specific to protect the particles. Cancel. Before the consecration, the priest is not allowed to put his hands on the corporal. He has to put them on the outsides of the corporal. After the consecration, he's got his fingers closed. He puts his hands on the corporal. When he's genuflecting to genuflect on the altar, yeah. What happened? It stopped. So start of Jane reflecting. That's fine. It's still on. Um, thank you. Um, 
when he genuflects after the consecration, he's going to place his hands on the corporal because of the particles. He's going to protect his hands with the particles. Uh, he's going to protect his the particles with his hands on the corporal. This goes, uh, no, let me. When the priest breaks the host, so the host goes on the corporal during the mass, like flat on the corporal, it doesn't go on the patent. The patent is brought out when the host is going to be broken. The priest will pull out the patent, he'll slide the host onto the patent, and then he'll take the host and he will break the host at the, at the fractioning of the host over the, over the chalice. In case any particles break off, they fall right into the chalice. So if the priest were to break the, uh, break the host over the patent, you'd get this copious amount of particles on the patent. So he breaks the host over the chalice. Wipes it off before he puts the, part, the, the, the piece down. Um, there is equal care for the chalice as there is for the host. So every time that the priest goes to uncover the chalice, he he hits the but he holds the bottom of the ho uh, he holds the bottom of the chalice, the base of the chalice still, before he uncovers the top of the chalice, just in case he were to knock it over and were to spill. So he holds the chalice steady before he uncovers the chalice and so on. There are three cloths. There should be three cloths on the altar and they should be linen. Just in case if the chalice were to tip over and spill, those three linen cloths will be able to absorb uh, the precious blood without it spilling onto the altar or spilling onto the floor, God forbid. For Holy Communion, you'll notice after the priest receives Holy Communion, he takes the paten and he scrapes the corporal where the host was, and then he wipes off those particles into the chalice before he consumes the chalice. So all those particles are accounted for. Then at Holy Communion, we have the altar server with a communion patent. If you have, in an ideal world, you would have a communion cloth over the altar rail. Um, and sometimes the ceremoniale calls for a communion cloth, which is a, a long white cloth that two altar servers hold. With the altar cloth, uh, with the with the altar rail cloth, it's a cloth that goes over the altar rail, and when you get there, instead of folding your hands, you place your hands under that cloth, and you hold your hands kind of like this. You make a little bowl with your hands with that cloth, and the altar server has the communion pattern as well. So when the priest comes to give you holy communion. He very carefully pulls the host out of the ciborium. He makes the sign of the cross with the host. He's actually giving you a blessing with that host when he's making the sign of the cross with the host. However, the host does not exceed the confines of the top of the ciborium. So just so that we don't drop any particles, the priest makes the sign of the cross just over the top of the ciborium. So if any particles fall, they fall into the ciborium. Then he's going to place the host directly on your tongue. In the meantime, the altar server has got the patent underneath the host to catch any particles that might fall. If the host were to fall, if the, host, if the priest were to drop the host, you've got um, the, the patent waiting there to catch the host. And if the patent doesn't catch the host, you've got the cloth, the altar rail cloth that then catches the host, so the host is caught and doesn't fall on the floor. 
if that happens after mass that altar rail cloth is then purified in the same way as the linens are purified which I'll get into in a minute <clears throat> this incidentally is why you cannot receive communion on the hand at a Latin Mass because all the rubrics of the Latin Mass are so precise to catch every single particle that it goes against everything that the extraordinary form is to then go ahead and give someone communion on the hand. It's, we're, we're trying to save all the particles here so you can't get communion on the hand with the Latin Mass. People are worried about germs and uh, the other day I had a cold so I can understand being worried about germs if the priest has a cold or whatever. What you're failing to notice when people are worried about germs, what they fail to notice is that the priest is touching the host anyway. So whether he puts it in your hand or whether he puts it on your tongue, it's the same amount of germs. You actually get more if he puts it on your hand because your hands are dirtier than directly on your tongue. And also the priests in the extraordinary form are good at giving communion, usually. <laughs> so usually I can go several weeks without touching anybody's tongue. So the odds of me touching someone's tongue and then touching your tongue are very low. Um, so, germs, that's just a, that's just a myth. The, the germs, it's not an issue. Okay, so there's more, there's more. The priest is not allowed to leave the altar after the consecration, as long as there are particles on the altar. So, the example is All Souls Day. The priest is allowed to say three Masses on All Souls Day. And there's a certain way to, to not purify the chalice so that the chalice still has... The, the priest drank the precious blood, but there might be a drop left in the chalice because he didn't rinse it out. And um, when that chalice is empty on the altar and covered up, the priest is not allowed to leave the sanctuary because the precious blood is still there in the chalice. There's a certain way to purify the Blessed Sacrament after communion. So, uh, and you've all seen it. First of all, the priest brings the patent that the altar service had and he wipes the patent off. First of all, he puts the Blessed Sacrament back in the tabernacle, closes the tabernacle door. Then he wipes the patent off into the chalice and puts the patent to the side of the altar for the altar servers to pick up and take back to the credence table. Then the altar server will bring over the wine and pour in the wine into either the chalice or into the ciborium if there is a ciborium to be purified. And the particles in the ciborium are rinsed off into the chalice and then the priest consumes the chalice. Then he goes over to the side and he purifies his fingers first with a few drops of wine and then with um, or, or however much wine the priest really wants and then however much water the priest really wants. Then he dries his fingers with the purificator then he, uh, if he had done that into the ciborium, he'll pour that ciborium into the chalice and then consume that. Then he will dry out the ciborium and then he will dry out the chalice and then he will rebuild the chalice. So all those particles have been accounted for. At that stage, according to the rubrics, if the rubrics were followed, no particle was lost. So every time the priest did not have the host in his hand, his hands were, his fingers were closed. The patent was used for communion. Um, the, the particles were scraped off the corporal. The corporal was then folded just in case in some way there were particles still on there. 
and so on. After Mass, you have the corporal and you've got the purificator. The, the purificator and the corporal had direct contact with particles and with the precious blood, drying out the chalice and so on. What do you do with that? Well, those were, are put in a special place. They are put in a special pile in the sacristy, and when there are enough of them, a priest or a deacon needs to purify them. So he'll take them and he will pray Psalm 50 while he is rinsing these out in three separate waters. And each one of those waters are then taken out to the garden or chipped down the sagrarium, poured into the sagrarium. So they are purified three separate times. After those three times, if there were any particles in there, they'd been washed out. And then they are thrown into the wash and ironed accordingly. Suppose the priest tips over the chalice. Then you have, or suppose he gets a drop of precious blood onto the altar cloths. The same thing is done with those altar cloths. So they are taken off the altar carefully after Mass. They are folded inward. And then they are taken, and by a priest, they are purified three times. A priest or deacon, they are purified three times with three separate waters while he prays the miserere, and then they are washed. If by some misfortune the host drops, if it drops onto the altar rail cloth, the same thing is done with the altar rail cloth, three separate washings. If it falls onto the floor, what happens? Next to the tabernacle there is a small bowl that bowl is there for two purposes. First of all, if communion is given outside of Mass, the priest will purify his fingers into that bowl. Or if there is an assistant priest at the Mass, he'll purify his fingers into that bowl. Or else, if a host falls at Mass, the altar server will, will go, the priest will pick up the host where it falls, the priest alone picks it up, nobody else goes and grabs it. The altar server will come and he will bring the purificator that's next to that bowl. And the priest will instruct him where to lay it out on the ground. And he will fold it out where the host fell. And if the host misfortunately rolled, it will cover that spot where the host rolled. So you lay out the purificator on the ground. You go grab a candle uh, and you put the candle next to it. And then mass continues on. Uh, except people are careful not to step on that spot where the host fell. After Mass, the priest will go take off his vestments, put on a stall, and he'll come back and he'll grab that bowl from the altar. And he will purify that spot with three separate washings uh, to pick up any possible particle that could have fallen uh, or been left there from the host falling. And then the, the bowl is tipped down the sagrarium and the purificator is then washed in the three separate washings um, with the other linens. So really, everything's been accounted for. It's really a beautiful thing to see how the rubrics of the liturgy are so precise that our Lord is present in the host, in, its, in his substance, and it's accounted for. There is no um, lack of respect for our Lord, even in the fact that the smallest particle is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Okay, questions?